Hello all. Um, in physics, we are going to be concerned with um, physical phenomena, and we're also going to be concerned with the math that describes that physical phenomenon. Mother Nature uh, has done a wonderful job of really having nice, um, in, in a lot of cases, simplistic relationships, that, uh, mathematical, rela mathematical relationships that describe the motion and the behavior of the way everything works. Um, so we're going to explore the, the, the very basic uh, kinds of mathematical relationships. They're very ideal uh, in today's presentation. Um, they're, um, and they're the basis of the rest of all the more complicated uh, relationships in math. The first one you're probably very familiar with. Uh, you learned it in Algebra 1, probably before Algebra 1 and that would be a linear relationship. And we all are familiar with a linear relationship with the formula. So actually, before we begin, linear relationship. Um, a lot of us are familiar with y equals mx plus b. And a lot of us are familiar with what that graph would look like. Now, I'm going to explain why I'm going to use certain quadrants in a moment. Um, but in physics class and in other classes, we might not use M as uh, the letter to describe the slope. A lot of the times we use K. And K represents the constant needed in a particular formula to keep the formula um, in line uh, on each side. Um, and of course, X. And in an ideal situation, um, a very ideal situation, we won't even have a y-intercept. We'll have to say that, well, that, that relationship goes right through the, the origin, and b would become zero. So for today's discussion, we're going to assume very ideal conditions where there's not even uh, an offset of the function from one side to the other or vertically up or down. We're going to say that that function is centered around the origin. Uh, so y equals kx. Still a linear relationship. It, with this k value is a constant value. y goes up, x has to go up. y goes down, uh, x has to go down by the same factor. Um, and in a lot of cases, this is the generic way of representing it, but in a, in a lot of cases, we're going to represent it with actual variables um, that we're analyzing or looking at in a situation. Um, one of the first ones you're going to learn in this class is um, you're going to learn... Um, the relationship between distance and time when an object is traveling. If an object rolls down the street, well, it can go a certain distance in a certain amount of time. And so what we'll do is we'll say, all right, well, let's actually substitute in the letters for those particular variables. Distance is going to be uh, dependent uh, upon uh, the time. So we have the dependent and independent variables. And we can represent that. Um, if we have data, whether it be table or graph form, um, we can read that data and determine even more information about the linear relationship. Uh, for instance, if we have a nice line, um, straight curve, straight curve, straight line on our graph, by the way, before I, be, before I go any further, when we do make our graphs, a couple things need to happen. We need um, labels on our axes. This has to happen all the time. And we need a title for our graph. And it can be as simple as you know, D versus T, distance versus time. Um, you can make it a little fancier at times if you want, but that's good enough. Um, if we happen to know a point, on our graph, and I'm going to come up with some ridiculous numbers here just to show some other things. Um, let's say that we know 8.00 um, and 40.000. Okay, so that's our x and y coordinate there. Um, I put a bunch of extra zeros because I'm playing with sig figs. Um, yes, it's ridiculous. Sorry, not sorry. So we know a point. 
And if we know a point, we can figure out the remainder of this particular formula. We can find out what, what is that k value actually worth? Because if we assume an ideal, a perfectly ideal relationship, a perfectly linear relationship where the y-intercept is zero, I can take any known point and plug in the value for d and t and come up with k. Now some of you are savvy and know that that's basically finding, in this particular case, the slope. Right? Because slope, k, would be change in y over change in x or change in d over change in t. Um, of course, that's assuming that 0, 0 would be the other point. And you'd be finding the slope of that triangle. So if we plug in those values, we're effectively finding slope in this particular case. So let's uh, plug it in. Um, we're going to put 40.000 here, k, 8.00 here, and we're going to solve this. And if we solve it, well, 40 divided by 8 is 5, but I'm playing with ridiculous uh, significant figures here, so it would be 5.00. Oh, sig figs need to stick here, even when we're finding the constant. What also needs to stick here is the units. This k value needs units to make the formula dimensionally valid. Uh, and those units are going to come literally from the, the y and x, uh, the dependent and independent values. Well, if d is in meters and t is in seconds, that's going to make this uh, meters per second. So I hope, I didn't show some of the steps there, but I, I hope you can look at that and realize that. So k is 5.00 meters per second. Now, I can then finalize this and put this into the equation and make a final version of the equation. That's why, wow, sorry about that. d equals 5.00 t. Now, I know some people and some teachers will actually put the units in the formula with the, with the k value. Some teachers will write uh, 5.00 meters per second times t. I find that confusing because just, it's just too much letters in the formula, especially when the formulas get more complicated, to have the units in with the variables. Uh, um, so I don't do that. I just need you to keep in mind that that k value does have units. Um, and write that value in. Except I haven't had enough coffee because that is not what I want to write. That's what I want to write. Sorry. Um, there's our finalized version of this particular formula. So this is um, linear uh, equations, um, fleshing them out. And realize that this linear equation and this graph, they do have physical meaning. This is how much this object is moving per second, which you might know already, and we're going to learn very quickly in the next couple days, is, is the beginning of, of speed. How fast is the object traveling? And, uh, and you know, in these particular graphs, especially speed graphs, you know, if you have um, uh, curves that are really, really, really steep, well, that means that that you're moving a lot of meters per second, that means you're probably moving pretty fast. If you happen to see one of these uh, graphs where the, the, the slope of the line is, is slow or a small value, well, that means you're not moving a lot of meters per second. So you're moving kind of slow. So these are not just to be thought of as just algebra and math exercises. These do have physical meaning and they can be interpreted. And uh, as we progress through the year, um, that'll become more evident. But I want you to keep that in mind as we move forward. All right, thanks. Uh, we're going to do the next uh, relationship in a minute. All right. So right now we're going to do an inverse relationship. Um, an inverse relationship has the form of y equals k times 1 over x, which is kind of dumb. We can just say y equals k over x. K is your constant. That's what uh, we're going to need to figure out to see what value makes the y and x connect. 
If y goes up, x has got to go down and vice versa, inverse. And the graph shape typically looks like that. And again, this is an ideal version where we don't have the graph shifting up, down, or side to side. Um, again, if we want, we can say that, you know, this represents, a, uh, or graphs like this represent physical meaning. And, and if you remember from chemistry, um, ideal gases can have a relationship where volume and pressure are inverse. Um, and again, we can try to determine, if, if we get information from a, from a table or a, a graph, we can take information and try to determine that K value and then find the final form of the formula. Um, we're going to use a ridiculous um, value here again. Um, and again, this is for the sake of arguing sig figs. We're going to say we're going to use a value of 2.00000. And we're going to say we're going to use a value of uh, 50.000. So, yeah, it, these values are ridiculous. Why so many zeros? I don't know. Let's. Again, it's an exercise in significant figures, um, just to keep you on top of that. So if we take these values and plug them in, all right, so we have uh, 50.000 equals K over um, 2.00000. By the way, if this is volume and pressure, uh, we need to understand that the volume is in meters cubed and the pressure is in pascals. So you would have been needed to be told what the measurements were, or what the units were, and of course we should have had volume versus pressure. We need a title on that graph. Um, so we need to know those units, and so I should have given them to you earlier. Um, well now that I know them, I can apply them when I find my K value. Now it's pretty easy to see that my K value here is gonna be equal to 100. And I gotta use five sig figs uh, when I do that because of I have five here and six there. I also, of course, need to do the units to my K value. Um, and if I look, well, the volume was meters cubed. And I'm going to multiply by Pascal's. So we have units on the, on the K value there. And then, of course, I can finish up the equation. We can say V equals 100.00 divided by P. Uh, and there we go. Thank you.